thanks everyone for attending the third lecture of the cycle on uh, contemporary political topics organized by, uh, by the PhD in political science. Uh, Universidade de Aveiro, Universidade de Aveiro Interior, with the support of the Praxis Research Center. Well, I hope that the uh, presentation and the debate will be productive for all of you. Well, today we, uh, we will uh, have a guest speaker, uh, Guilherme Marcos uh, Pedro, and uh, as uh, a moderator, uh, Michel Macedo who is student of the first year of our doctoral program in, in political science. Uh, I, I thank you uh, both for accepting this, uh, the invitation and uh, um, immediately I give the word to Michelle. Michelle, please <laughs> talk. <laughs> Hi everyone. Thank you, Professor. Welcome to this session of Brexit Cycle of Lectures. Uh, uh, the last one of the semester, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, mm -hmm. as Professor Maria João said, my name is Michele. I am a PhD student on political science program from University of Aveiro and University of Aveiro Interior. I would like to thank Professor Maria João for inviting me to moderate this session. It, it is an honor to me and I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, as you know, today our lecture will be about uh, human rights and migration with a focus on individual rights and state oblig obligations sorry in the contemporary migrations this lecture will be presented by the professor Guilherme Marx Pedro professor Guilherme Marx Pedro who the PhD from the department of international politics in let me say if I let, let <laughs> <laughs> I can <insist. laughs> no, it, it's difficult. I try I know. hard. I try hard. I'm trying hard. Aubrey Sweet, Aubrey good, Sweet good, good. University and the master degree from the University of Cambridge. He teaches international relations and international law at the University of Berlinterio and at the University of Coimbra. His research interests lie in international political theory and the history of international law with a focus on the place of migration rights in the liberal tradition. He's also finished his second PhD at the Department of Philosophy in Uppsala University. In 2017, he published the book Hengho Naila and the International Relations Theory with Outledge and in 2018, he published an article on Hans Morgenthau's International Legal Theory. He is now finalizing a monograph on migration ethics and law with a focus on the human right to live. Hopefully. So, Professor, <laughs> <laughs> so, Professor Guilherme, welcome. You have uh, uh, 45 minutes to present the, the lecture. I would like to know when you have uh, uh, 10 minutes remain okay. okay and after that we'll have time for debate questions and comments so professor Guilherme, the floor is yours right okay um então eu vou eu vou fazer isto em inglês mas queria queria dizer obviamente que se quiserem fazer perguntas em português uh, estão, estão à vontade para isso, não sei enfim, se o formato uh, permitir, como é óbvio. Sim, sim, sim. So, uh, I, I'd like to start to by, by thanking uh, Michel and obviously by thanking uh, Maria João, uh, uh, my great colleague, and André Barata. Uh, and I'd like to start also by uh, saying um, what an what an amazing job you have been doing as uh, philosophers at the at the University of Very Interior, you know, moving forward this agenda in philosophy and ethics, and practical ethics, and also political philosophy. That's uh, something that, um, of course, makes me very proud. Not only because it's a university, it's the university where I started teaching but also um, uh, it's the university of my my hometown so <laughs> uh, so obviously it's I'm, I, I am really honored to be here and to uh, 
be able to present my work on this uh, issue. Um, <laughs> and so um, thank you all for, for coming and for having me. Um, what I want to do is to present a, an overall picture of my current research, which is being conducted at the University of Uppsala, and it's on its way to becoming a monograph. How long that will take, of course, I'm not able to uh, say yet, but I would just like to say that it's uh, both on the ethics of migration and on the law of migration. Originally, it's a, it's a PhD in the philosophy of law, but given that it is in a philosophy department, it also has a great bearing on ethics, uh, on the ethics of migration. So it's, and actually the thesis, as you will see, uh, covers both the ethical side about moral rights and the uh, juridical side about legal rights of migration. The, I would say that the distinctive part or the distinctive aspect is that it focuses on the global regime of international migration. So as you know, there is a lot of research on migration spread uh, across several fields, namely uh, sociology, international relations, political science, and of course law. Um, but um, that research usually is concerned about either um, national or regional policies toward migration, namely, for instance, EU policy toward migration, or um, it, can, it, it is about a, a broader ethical debate, mainly between communitarians and cosmopolitans about uh, migration in general. And my, my research tries to sort of uh, uh, make the bridge between these two, on the one side, a very sort of localized approach to migration and on the other, very broad ethical approach. Uh, by focusing on the actual international legal regime. Now, an international regime is usually defined as the, uh, the set of rules and principles and norms, legal norms, that govern, um, that govern a specific um, uh, uh, um, a specific activity or action among international actors. So that's what an international regime is. So when you talk about international regimes, you can talk about, you know, a, a climate regime or a human rights regime or a, a set of sub regimes that exist uh, out there. And I'm concerned about uh, a, a migration regime that is the norms and rules that govern the migration of human beings across the earth. And so uh, I'm, not, I'm not just focusing on Europe or you know, South America or whatever, I'm, I'm focusing on, on the global uh, um, side of things. So that's one thing I would like to say. Another thing I'd like to say is that I'm going to um, project um, a set of slides here and and so do, do let me know if you don't uh, see them if you can't if you can't uh, uh, see what I'm projecting as of now. Um, here we go. Okay. Um, so. <clears throat> Um, oops, sorry. No, no, here it is. Yeah. So some of these slides are a bit older. Uh, and I, of course, the research is uh, working progress, even though it's reaching its end. So it's not entirely working progress in the sense of uh, being a preliminary um, uh, research. Uh, and I'm certainly not going to take the whole 40 minutes or 45 minutes. But uh, uh, in any case, 
feel free to interrupt me along the way if anything doesn't isn't clear enough. Um, okay, so here we go. My research question, like I was saying, addresses the um, the issue of what exactly are the rules that govern migration worldwide? Okay, so. Um, as I was saying, and I, I will be uh, referring to that along the way, there are specific rules of specific regions of the world um, about uh, basically the two essential movements of migration. And these are either you go out of a country or you get into a country, okay? I know I'm being very simplistic about this, but this is just the way it works. So basically today we are in a world, and I'm going to refer to some historical background in which probably, that, well, not probably, I mean, certainly that wasn't the case. And the case is this, that whenever you get out of a country, you get into another country as a migrant, okay? Um, of course, there are a few exceptions to this, but generally speaking, one can say that today at the current stage of international political order, the whole Earth's surface is covered by state jurisdiction, okay? That does not mean that the whole territory of the world belongs to a state, which is a different thing. It also does not mean that necessarily um, um, uh, the whole the whole earth is uh, under watch, so to say, by a given state. But it does mean that whoever you are, you are um, by law by international law, and later on I'm also going to refer to that, um, under the radar, so to speak. So you are, um, and you can take this uh, in a very sort of liberal or positivist direction, or you can take this in a Foucaultian direction, in the Foucaultian direction of governmentality, no matter how or how you take it, you are governed, your behavior is governed by states, okay? Uh, whether or not that is your national state, that is your state of citizenship, that is a different thing. But the, the, so the point here is that uh, the whole surface of the earth is today almost uh, all of it covered by state jurisdiction, okay? Uh, of course, there are some parts of the world which are beyond state's territory and for instance high seas the high seas you know where you see a lot of people uh fleeing to trying to escape uh, state oppression for instance and you, of course in that you would uh, categorize a lot of the current um, refugees refugees in the informal sense of people that are trying to escape um, oppression at home or some sort of war or some sort of threat um, and then you obviously find all of these boats filled in with uh, migrants from everywhere, not only in the Mediterranean. Of course, we as Europeans like to think that the migration crisis is here, and part of it is, that is true, especially since the end of the Syrian war, sorry, the beginning of the Syrian war, of course, is at our uh, European borders, but uh, actually, when you look at the UN numbers, statistically, um, most of the migration crises are actually far away from Europe. Um, but in any case, and uh, I can refer to that uh, also with statistics, but uh, in any case, what is relevant here is that migration is obviously in crisis uh, everywhere in the world, in every single continent, and that's why it becomes so uh, relevant. 
um, as a political topic, which is precisely the, uh, the theme of the of these uh, seminar series. Okay, so um, having said this, uh, I also want to say that, of course, this is a, a, a an urgent matter, uh, uh, practically speaking, politically speaking, but it's also a matter that is very important philosophically, and philosoph by philosophical I mean that the, there are debates about, um, you know, there there are debates in the sense that are philosophical arguments being um, thrown out there in favor or against, uh, and um, um, in favor or against of, of course, admission of migrants. And these uh, debates fall into two categories, which are on the one hand, legal uh, debates and on the other, ethical debates. Okay, so there is a moral debate that I was referring to previously, which is about the moral rights of migrants, and th that is a philosophical debate on the side of practical ethics, mostly between communitarians on, or, and cosmopolitans, which, which, by the way, me and Maria Joan has, have been uh, dealing with in our current attempts to get funding from the National Science Foundation in Portugal, which we didn't, but we eventually will get there <laughs> at some point. Um, but in any case, there's that debate, which is monopolized by that sort of opposition, which my argument shows that it doesn't exhaust the whole ethical aspect of that debate. Uh, and I'll get to that in a second. And then there's the legal debate uh, as well, which is about what are what exactly are the the state duties toward others, uh, basically towards foreigners that come into the territory or are already in the territory or are potentially um, emigrating from other countries to come to. Um, other countries. Okay, so in this context, <laughs> my um, research question concerns the conditions under which um, a human right to leave a country entails a right to enter another country. And here, by entailment, I'm not just referring to the logical concept of entailment, because entailment has its own uh, place within uh, logic and deontic logic mostly. Uh, people refer to entailment when they talk about relations between rights. I'll get to that in a second as well. But the point here is that whether you use entail or correspondence or interaction between rights, the point here is that there are people, okay, both legal theorists and ethical um, or moral philosophers that claim that there is a relationship of some kind between leaving a country and entering another one. And there are those that claim that there is not such a relationship. And the point of my, of my research is to map uh, these arguments, both on the legal side and on the moral side of things, uh, and to say whether or not this makes sense to pose this question, what are the implications of saying yes to this question or no to this question, but also uh, what are the assumptions underlying each claim? I mean, what do people assume when they say that yes, leaving a country necessarily means entering another one or um, or not, that it does not uh, mean entering another one, okay? So I'm going to move forward. I hope that you're, um, that you can, uh, yeah. I hope that you can, uh, see as I go through. I, I hope that you can you can see the slides on, on the other side. Uh, if if you can't, then just let me know, uh, and I'll try to come up with some 
solution, which I wouldn't know what it is, but <laughs> okay. So um, let me just start by framing this whole research in terms of um, one, uh, one of the major claims that appeared in the literature. This was not the first claim to appear in the literature. And later on, I'm going to explore the history, this, I'm, I mean the intellectual history of this debate, uh, which goes as far back as um, Westphalia and the Westphalian peace agreements, which are from 1648, as you know. Uh, that has to do with uh, a more recent interest of mine, which has to do with the, the history of migration rights and how leaving and entering relate to each other and how authors themselves, classic authors, of course, uh, um, focus on that sort of interaction. But um, my current research, which is now reaching its end, um, is about the ethical and legal, but, but the, the, both of them contemporary debates about this. And of course, I'm going to show you that, of course, the, the, uh, just to, I, sh I should start by saying, you know, the right to leave is, is a human right, okay? Uh, so maybe, I mean, I can show you where it appears. Um, sorry. Um, so uh, by RL here, uh, I'm not sure if you are seeing this, but RL means the right to leave. And legally speaking, when we talk about a legal right, we are talking about a right that means a legal entitlement to uh, someone or something, okay? To do something or not to do something. Um, so it's the freedom that is protected by the security perimeter of the law. The law is a securitizing uh, uh, regime, is a securitizing instrument that protects our freedom, right? So if you have a legal right to leave, that you, if you have a legal right to anything, actually, uh, that usually means that you have a, uh, that someone else, namely in, in, in terms of human, uh, the human rights regime, that the state has a duty, a corresponding duty, a correlative duty, to protect that right in some way. That usually means that uh, that right then uh, gives ground to other sorts of rights. So for instance, if I have a right to leave a country, that usually means that I have a right, a legal right, to get access to some sort of documents that um, then ensure me to leave uh, that country without being um, oppressed or uh, hindered in some way. Uh, you could say the same about the right to free speech or any other sort of liberty right. Uh, and then that sort of draws us into a debate about what sort of right the right to leave is I'm not going into that as, as right now. Uh, I can go into that later if you ask me. But basically, um, what I'm saying here is that there is an international migration regime, okay, um, and that the right to leave is a core element of this regime. Um, there are historical reasons for that, which I can also go into later on if you ask me which have to do with the fact that uh, the human rights global regime is mostly, can be characterized mostly as a liberal uh, regime in the sense that it privileges individual rights against the state. Now, there are several authors that have spoken about this. Um, uh, I'm, most recently, the work of Samuel Moyne is very interesting with regard to sort of the liberal nature of human rights. But the point is that um, at the end of the World War, uh, so from, nine, from the 1940s onwards, and of course the um, Universal Declaration of Human Rights uh, that was approved in 1948, uh, but it was not uh, binding upon 
states, and in any case was approved by a very small number of states. It, it was actually negotiated by only a few number of states. Um, we like to refer to it, but at the, at the time it meant very little, actually. So it was a document that was mostly a political uh, instrument of propaganda about what the human rights um, ought to look like when you positivize them into law. And so, um, the, uh, as you can see in the background of this picture here, the human right to leave, Article 13 of the Human Rights Declaration, which was here, um, um, sorry, the Human Rights Declaration of 1948, tells us that everyone has the right to freedom of uh, movement and residence within the borders of each state. Okay, so you, you are free to move within your own state of nationality. That means that if you're a Portuguese citizen, then the Portuguese state nor anyone else can hinder you from moving around. And number two to that same article, Article 13, tells us that everyone has the right to leave any country, including his own, and to return to his own country, okay? Now, there are two sides to this second part of this article. Uh, one is that uh, you have a right to leave. So if I'm a Portuguese citizen, um, Portugal does not have the right to stop me from leaving, okay? That is an important, that is a very important thing and it's a conquest, uh, uh, civilizing uh, conquest, if you wish, uh, from um, uh, still at this time fairly westernized way of seeing the world. We're talking about after Second World War, of course, uh, the issues about um, you know Jews being prosecuted, persecuted within uh, Nazi Germany, as well as uh, uh, Jews and Gypsies being persecuted in the Soviet Union right after have a great bearing on this. Uh, uh, and of course, the point here is to sort of promote that sort of individual freedom uh, legally um, by making states um, 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 liable internationally should they forbid people from leaving their uh, territory or their jurisdiction. Uh, and I can talk a little bit about that distinction as well. Th that was w one thing. So the right to leave becomes a very important thing because historically, um, the concern, and I, I should say this already before getting into the historical detail, which I can get to a little bit uh, further on, but the right to leave a country, so the right to exit the borders of a given country has always been more important both morally and legally. I mean, you can even look at the writings of major political philosophers from you know, John Locke onwards, or even before that, Grotius. Um, and you see that the right to leave is a much more important thing than the right to enter somewhere else. And the point here being that, uh, given that the earth hasn't always been uh, covered or governed by state jurisdiction, um, uh, it became less important where you would land or where you would go into. Uh, what was more important was that the state would let you leave, okay? And that sort of grounds the idea that the right to leave uh, in human rights law since the declaration um, corresponds to the duty of the state from which you leave to let you leave. <laughs> um, um, so that's an important um, point. However, I would also like to, to say and to um, emphasize the point that 
Article 13 also says that uh, not only you are entitled to leave your own country, you are entitled to leave any country, okay? So let's say that I am, as a Portuguese citizen, I am in Spain, or let's say, well, uh, for, for any of the signatories of this uh, declaration, which was then um, sort of positivized in, in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, that one became binding uh, for sure, the Covenant, and that is from 67, and it, it only entered into force in 76, if I recall correctly. And the point here is that, um, again, everyone shall be free to leave any country, including his own. Um, and uh, the point about any country, the, this phrase is very important because if it was only about your own country, that is your, your country, your citizenship, then, you know, Portugal would be obliged to let me leave as much as Spain would be obliged to let the Spaniards leave. But then Spain would not be obliged to let the Portuguese leave necessarily, okay? And so the point, uh, the, 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 uh, the spirit of the law in this sense is that any country that is signatory to the ICCPR, Article 12, in the uh, Declaration of Human Rights was Article 13, but the content is the same. Um, the point is that, you know, any country that is signatory, that is a, a party to the treaty, allows you to, um, uh, allows anyone to leave, not just their own citizens, okay, their own nationals, but also uh, 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 countries from other um, countries from other uh, sorry, uh, citizens, individuals from other countries. Um, so I might be a bit. Uh, um, If I was to be a bit uh, of a polemicist here, I would argue that, for instance, um, if that was to be taken to the European Court of Human Rights today, the case of, for instance, of the Ukrainian citizen that was killed at the hands of the Portuguese state recently, I mean, the, the human rights that the Portuguese state violated, infringed, by keeping a Ukrainian citizen in the airport were not only that he was tortured or that he was killed, but the mere fact that he was kept here without the possibility to leave uh, somewhere else was in itself a violation of, of a human right, okay? Uh, because he could then argue in the middle of the process, while he was being tortured, uh, whether or not there was a, this sort of ridiculous thing, whether or not there's a button that you can press and call the authorities to claim, let me leave, I'm being tortured, I'm being a victim of aggression by official authorities. The point there would be that was he to claim that he wanted to leave uh, Portugal not necessarily to return to Ukraine, but even to go to France or to Spain or whatever. Um, that is in itself a violation of a, of a human right to leave because you have a human right to leave, okay? And um, this is one of those rights that you, uh, well, first of all, you can claim against any state, uh, unless that state is not a signatory of uh, any of the human rights conventions that, appro that apply either regionally or globally. There are very few now that don't, so it would be uh, uh, useless. Of course, then you can ask, well, where's the court that can apply that law? But at least in Europe, there is a human rights court whose jurisdiction lies, goes much further than the, the European Union. So the Human Rights Court is not a court of the European Union. It's a court that uh, extends beyond, and it's actually historically even previous to um, the European Union as a community. And there are a lot of countries that are not part of the European Union, such as, I don't know, Switzerland or whatever, that are not part of the European Union that actually are signatories to that court and to the convention, the 
uh, European Convention of Human Rights of 59. And so um, the point here being that uh, would that Ukrainian citizen claim that, listen, people, uh, the Portuguese state is not violating any of my human rights. It's just that I, he, the, the Portuguese state is keeping me here uh, against my will to flee. That in itself is a violation okay, of international law. So Portugal was already, uh, I, I mean, not only in the case of that Ukrainian citizen, but in many other cases. And that applies even more to Spain and especially to Italy and Greece, which are the countries that are known for having kept for the for a longer period the greatest uh, number of people at their airports or at their uh, refugee camps or whatever. Um, of course, these people are in a, in a sort of a legal limbo for all sorts of reasons. Um, um, precisely because they cannot enter, but they cannot also leave. Um, most of them actually don't even have a legal status that allows them to identify their nationality. I mean, there are all sorts of problems. I mean, it's, it's just, a, it's, it's, um, um, it's chaos from a, a juridical perspective. And I have a lot of friends back in Uppsala that are analyzing uh, detention on the grounds of, uh, on on the on grounds that are not the grounds that usually legally are the only ones that licitly allow for detention, which are criminal ones, of course, uh, and that is obviously the major problem of uh, these camps. But I, I'm not concerned with that, of course. I'm just saying that this sort of illustrates a point, uh, which is the crucial point of my thesis again, that. Um, you have a human right to leave. This is a legal right, okay? It's not just a moral right. Of course, you can also claim it's a moral right. Of course, you have uh, a moral right to, a moral right means uh, 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 an ethical claim of some sort that is justifiable on moral reasons that everyone can sort of uh, um, comprehend, even though they might disagree, but, um, um, uh, that would get us into what exactly is a moral reason, which is a which is a very sort of analytically philosophical question. But the, the question here is that um, there is a moral right to leave, but that right has became has become uh, legal um, uh, um, uh, uh, through history, uh, and so this is uh, the sort of the basis of. Uh, the international migration regime. I should also like to add the last bit of this article, okay, which is that you have a right to leave any country, any country, but you are only allowed to enter one country in the world. And this is the sort of the crux of the matter here. This is the uh, core problem of my analysis. Uh, which I call the Flying Dutchman asymmetry. And the asymmetry lies in this, that there is, you, you can leave any country in the world. You are legally entitled to leave any country in the world. So that means that basically no country can hinder you from leaving. Um, otherwise that country may face legal consequences or, or some sort of punishment or sanction. Um, or reproach anyway from um, uh, the UN Rights Com Human Rights Commission or uh, other countries or you know being a sort of a diplomatic uh, strain of some sort um, or even obviously being brought to court. Uh, of course, human rights courts, as you know, are regional. We don't have a world court. We don't have a world state. And so no one can actually punish states from b b by their behavior, but uh, there would be legal consequences if a country were to uh, stop people from leaving, whether or not they're nationals. And I can give you examples of that as well. Um, uh, well, actually, let me just say that a very interesting example actually came from Portugal, which I found 
uh, but that was, I mean, it was during the dictatorship, but it's, it's very interesting. Uh, um, um, so what I'm showing here, okay, sorry, let me just make sure I can do this properly. So very quickly, uh, this is a, um, a newspaper, a news from a newspaper in Sweden. And it says, uh, six Portuguesiska officera shoker e shelher. That means that uh, six Portuguese officials seek asylum in, Swe in Sweden, not just in Sweden, actually in Uppsala, <laughs> where I was actually doing this research. And I, I found this uh, very interesting. This was uh, a case where um, um, sorry, I lost I lost your picture now I want to recover them. This was a case where six Portuguese officials from the Portuguese army during the Salazar regime uh, wanted looked for asylum in Sweden and then there's the news about it uh, but the point here was that the you know, whenever the, the right to leave, it shows this liberal nature of the, of the human right to leave, right? That the human right to leave is mostly, is, I mean, historically, it's geared toward people that actually, towards, uh, sorry, protecting people that actually want to flee dictatorial regimes. And the Portuguese uh, dictatorial regime was one that give grounds to, by its nature, you know, being authoritarian, authoritarian and persecuting those who wanted to escape. We know that uh, a lot of people, uh, especially uh, here by the border, uh, near Cuvillain and other cities by the border, are the towns who wanted to escape to Spain to do uh, wh what we call a salt, historically. Uh, salt, that was the uh, jump to uh, other country to escape the dictatorship. Um, were actually persecuted by uh, Salazar, but also by the Franco regime, which was uh, on the watch to see whether or not Portuguese individuals were escaping the regime through Spain, which, as you know, is the only uh, territorial border that we have. And so in that case, um, it, it, this news was interesting because there were a few officials that were seeking asylum, uh, mostly in France, but also in Sweden, and I found this news quite relevant for my for my research for, for obvious reasons. And so, uh, but going back to the main point here, I, now that I've shown you the um, the legal regime, I just wanted to focus on this particular aspect, which is okay. So there's a right to leave to given to everyone, to every single individual, with a few exceptions predicted by law, namely you know handicapped people, people that are in prison, obviously army officers, that's sort of a, a, a gray area of international law um, because if you're actually fighting in the war, then it's doubtful that you can actually leave. And, uh, but, but, and also if you, are, if you are a child, of course, you need to have permission from your parents, et cetera, et cetera. And there are all those clauses which are exceptional in international human rights law, of course, which have to do with uh, you know national security concerns and health concerns. So, for instance, now with the pandemic, of course, you are entitled to leave, but of course that is that right is qualified by the emergency situation that we are leaving. Um, and whether or not that emergency situation uh, can actually hinder you from leaving is a question that is, at the end, uh, up to the courts to decide. But I mean, generally speaking, we can say that you do have a uh, human right to leave any country, not just the country of your nationality. The, the other side of the coin to this, in the article, is that you have a right to return. So you actually have a right to enter in international law. 
So when people say, and this is one of the major assumptions that I'm sort of criticizing with this re research, is that a lot of people say, you know, you have a right to leave, a, he a human right to leave, and that is a legal right because it has been not only crystallized and enshrined in major international legal instruments, but it has also been absorbed by um, uh, constitutions, national legal systems. So for instance, in the Portuguese case, you have here at the national level the Portuguese Constitution, Articles 44 and 33. Uh, it's exactly the same phrasing of the Human Rights Declaration. Also, because of course, the Declaration, both the Declaration and the Convention, which are both global in nature. And especially the convention, because it has many, most of the uh, state, most of the world states uh, as signatories. Um, um, the the Portuguese constitution sort of repeats literally the phrasing of the of the human rights declaration. Okay, so basically, uh, the the regime is constituted by three essential parts: internal moving is free within the borders of your own state. Uh, leaving, so exit is uh, a liberty, a legal liberty, a liberty protected by the state. And um, the third one, which I wanted to focus on, is the right to return. This means that you have full rights of exit, but not full rights of entering and why is that so when people say like i was saying before that you know you have a human you have a right to leave from everywhere but you don't have the right to enter that's not exactly true and that sort of it seems to undermine the whole problem but it actually only adds to the problem okay because so here's the thing there is symmetry between rights. There is the idea that if you leave a country, then you are entitled to enter another country in, the, in international law. So when people say, you know, you have a right to leave, but you have no right to enter, that's actually wrong, according to the law. I mean, no matter what the ethical debate is about, of course, you can consider it right or wrong, and you have all sorts of argument. You know, you know, you have Michael Wald, Michael Walter, or people like John Finnis arguing against it, or you, or even John Rawls, for instance. Um, you have people arguing for it, like Joseph Karens, Phil Cole, uh, Rainer Bavok. But the point that that's the ethical debate. I can get into that later. The legal point here that I want to clarify is that there is symmetry. There is such a thing as a right to enter in international law. The only point is that, is that that right is highly qualified. It's actually very restricted. Why? Because the only country that you can actually enter once you have left is the country of your own nationality, <laughs> which is, of course, very problematic. <laughs> given that, you know, if the right to leave was created historically uh, a millennia ago, actually, to escape dictatorship or some sort of political oppression or threat or war on, on the grounds of your ethnicity or religion or gender or whatever, then, of course, you want to leave to somewhere else. You want to leave to another country. You don't want to leave and then have to return, of course. But in any case, the point is that the Human Rights Declaration does enshrine the right of return. And that was historically as well of importance because as you know, for instance, during the Portuguese Civil War, not Civil War, sorry, the Portuguese Colonial War, uh, a lot of people wanted to um, return to Portugal, sort of the, the so-called retornage, the returnees the, wanted to return to Portugal precisely because of independence and all the political insurgency that ensued. And so in that sense, the right of return was obviously important for Portuguese citizens. 
I'm not, uh, and I'm not, uh, I'm not, and they're playing that, uh, that, that the importance of that right. But of course, the asymmetry is clear. And here I refer to what I call the flying Dutchman asymmetry. Okay. And that is an asymmetry between rights. Uh, what is that exactly? It's an asymmetry between uh, a right to leave, that is a human right, sorry, <laughs> that is a human right um, against that you as an individual, as a human being, hold against any state that you are entitled to leave. So if I'm a Portuguese citizen, I'm not only entitled to leave Portugal, but I'm also entitled to leave Australia or Uruguay. They can't stop me from leaving. But if I do leave those states, then where can I go to? Okay. And at that point, at that juncture, that is a much more complicated issue. Um, because the only place you can go to is actually, I mean, in principle, by law, is your own state of nationality or the states, the state in which you can claim habitual residence, which is a state uh, w which is halfway to national citizenship. You know, if you have lived uh, for a long while in a country, you can claim a right of residence or a right at least to enter and access some sort of rights that are part of the legal status that you have in that country, uh, which is in itself derived from having been a, an habitual resident there. But the point here is that the countries that are obliged uh, by law to ensure the right to leave are not the same countries that are obliged by law to ensure the right to enter. And that's the asymmetry. Okay, that's the major uh, uh, concern of my research. This creates an asymmetry for all sorts of reason. I, I mean, you can claim that, you know, there's a, there are Marxist arguments for this, you know, that countries that are very rich can allow themselves to leave, to let leave certain citizens, but they surely won't allow poor individuals to come in. So there's a sort of an economic asymmetry, which has to do with the, the way that capitalist system works and the divide between uh, you know the global south and the rich north that is one interpretation of how sort of the, the, the economic factors play into the way that the international law is framed um, there are all sorts of reasons about the, that, that you can sort of uh, there are sort of all sorts of factors I mean that you can uh, mobilize to explain this but the point here is that there is an asymmetry a fundamental asymmetry in the sense that you have a human right to leave but you have no human right to enter elsewhere you only have a human right to re-enter basically so because you have a human right to return okay and so my research is about this uh how am i doing with time michelle sorry <laughs> You have uh, five minutes. Five minutes more. Okay, that's perfect. I'll just conclude by saying that um, um, there is a um, there are two sides to this debate. Okay, there are other aspects which which I can re refer to, but and there are also historical aspects. So you you know you have reflections, important philosophical reflections going all the way back to uh, Grotius. I have Locke here, but I wanted Grotius. <laughs> but in any way, there's Thomas Jefferson, Rousseau, and all. But the, the point, you know, the, the, is that there are people, you know, playing on, uh, arguing on, on, on different sides. Um, and uh, to this, I mean, historically, you can already spot a concern about rights of, of leave and leaving and of exit and entry in the in the Treaty of Westphalia uh, 1648 
um, it's claimed uh, that on Article 5th of the Treaty of Osnabrück, as you know, the Peace of Westphalia was uh, a treaty that is uh, known for establishing many principles of international law, namely, for instance, state sovereignty, of course. It's the first time that, you know, Holland and Switzerland are recognized as sovereign states. Of, of course, Holland would then go into another war with Spain to, uh, to try to prove that they were independent. But in any case, that's not the only point why Westphalia is important. I mean, Westphalia, and this is another of the arguments that I make, this is a more historical detail of the thesis that I make uh, in intellectual history, that Westphalia was also the first treaty to enshrine individual rights. And guess what rights were we were talking about? We were talking about migration rights, precisely, because, you know, Catholics wanted to, if they were living in a Protestant state, they wanted to be able to move freely across straits in Europe so that they can pray in the church of their own religion, uh, which was not the religion of their own state. Um, and they would have to not only be able to leave, but also to return. Okay, so in that case, there was a concern about letting the subjects uh, exercising their right to what was then called remove, right to remove oneself from one state, take their family, take their property, as long as they would pay their taxes, you know, not um, leave without paying their taxes. Of course, that was very important for Protestant states. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but I, I mean, there's a, a lot of uh, uh, reflections we can revisit historically about this. Um, but the contemporary regime, which is spelled out in this table that I've created, um, is that you have a right to leave, um, which is for the most part unqualified, uh, and then you have a right to return, sorry, you have a right to enter, which is highly qualified and highly restricted. It's qualified in the sense that it's only allowed, it's only given to uh, nationals mostly. So you have a right to return, which is in purple here, the purple triangle. Um, and then you have another right, and I, want to, I wanted to finish with this, um, which is another right of entering, uh, which is, of course, the right to seek asylum. But this is a highly, as you know, qualified right, um, because the point about this right, as it stands today in international law, and I can give you more detail about the actual legal instruments where you can you know, consult the content of this legal right, is that you have a right to seek asylum. It doesn't mean that you have a right to asylum. Right? Uh, so, you know, if an Ethiopian arrives at the borders of Italy and he's able to escape all that hustle from um, trying, you know, the, the Frontex, the European agency, trying to sort of uh, deliver him back to uh, the borders of Libya or Algeria or whatever, um, he still needs to prove once he arrives in Italy that he is entitled to asylum on the grounds that the law predicts, which are escaping from war or some sort of political persecution. If he's merely escaping from poverty, it is very likely that he actually won't get the, um, uh, the status of a refugee. And so in that case, uh, he has a right to seek, but it doesn't mean that he has a right to enjoy asylum. Uh, and that's, so it's a highly qualified right. So in that sense, there is an asymmetry here if you look at this picture between this very big orange triangle and the pink and the blue ones, okay? And of course, then there are other rights related to this. And uh, this sort of brings out another more theoretical argument that I'm trying to explore, which is how do we study the relations between rights, uh, interaction between rights? Usually legal thinkers, legal philosophers talk about bundles of rights, you know, to describe relations among rights, such as when you have, you know, a legal right to work, whether or not that then corresponds to, I don't know, a right to paid vacation or whatever then you're talking about relations between rights. You know, one macro right then relates to a sort of 
sub rights um, or micro rights that you can, I mean, and then I explore that in the thesis, but that's, I, I don't think that is uh, uh, of the utmost relevant to this um, presentation here. I just wanted to uh, focus finally on the two sides to this debate, okay? So there's a moral concern about this, that is about whether the current human rights regime is just. And that's what I partly, uh, I, I, it was sort of my own input into some research that I'm conducting with Marie's Raum here. Uh, in the sense that it ensures equality. So that's an ethical debate, it's a philosophical debate, right? Uh, whether or not it's just that you can let someone out without letting some uh, letting that person in into someone some other state. That is the, the sort of the moral debate, the moral issue. There are the symmetrists who claim that it is unjust, and the asymmetrists like Michael Walzer, of course communitarians saying um, on very justifiable grounds. Um, uh, and of course, I don't think it would be serious to just, you know, categorize these claims as just populist as we have a tendency to do when we look at contemporary political debates, including in Portugal. Uh, I, I think we do need to look more carefully at these debates, at these arguments, uh, because they are communitarian in nature, you know, the idea that you should privilege the rights of the individuals that are part of the community vis-a-vis uh, -vis those that are not. That is a legitimate moral argument. Um, it's uh, not necessarily xenophobic or a racist one, um, even though I would disagree with it still, um, but it is an argument that is out there. Uh, so when you see populists saying that, you know, um, um, uh, the community has a right of self-determination, which implies that we have, a, we as a community have a right to exclude, there are moral grounds to that claim, which I think should be taken seriously, even though we may, uh, I mean, how, however we may disagree with them. And then there's the legal issue. And the legal issue is not about whether or not the current regime is fair from a moral point of view. And I, I would just end with this, but whether or not, how are we to interpret the law? Okay. And I've been doing a lot of archival research on the UN archives, namely uh, to do with reports by the UN Human Rights Commission. Uh, that point in the direction of uh, interpreting a human right to leave as including, entailing, or interacting with a human right to enter somewhere else, okay? So not just a right of return, but um, a right to enter uh, into some other country. And that is um, a matter uh, which is not ethical, even though you could say, you know, all law is about ethics, which at the end is true, because, you know, law is an ethical system like any other one, functionally speaking, I mean, right? I mean, the law either allows you to do something or forbids you to do something. So it's, it's like another, any other ethical system. Um, but, the, but the point here is that it's not about whether the law is unjust, but how are we to interpret the law, right? Whether or not we should include a right to enter somewhere else in the very interpretation of a right to exit from somewhere. Um, and that is a legal a debate, which I, in the thesis at least, in the dissertation, I, I separate from the moral, uh, the moral issue. Of course, then following from these two this is an analytical, this is an analytical uh, depart, it's an analytical divide, uh, cleavage that I have my, have uh, created myself. Of course, you could also argue whether or not a legal right then gives rise to a certain moral expectation, for instance. Uh, so for instance, if having, holding the legal right to leave in itself is a moral reason to enter somewhere else, okay, 
And that sort of complicates the relation between law and morality, which is something that uh, sort of was actually one of the reasons why I wanted to study this, both from a legal and a, and a, a philosophical perspective. And this research is actually being conducted in the philosophy department. Um, even though for the most part I have been focusing on the law here. Uh, and, and that is because I think there are fundamental philosophical issues to be addressed here, um, which are beyond the scope of legal doctrine. So there are beyond the scope of uh, what is usually called legal dogmatics or legal interpretation. They have to do with larger ethical or moral considerations that people and especially judges when they are deciding in you know, the European Court of Human Rights bring in to their rulings uh, in order to interpret the law in this or that way. But in any case, this is the major divine that I find that I'm, I'm, and I'm sort of mapping the debate um, along these lines. So thank you. <laughs> thank you, Professor Guilherme. Thank you very much. It's a, it was a very interesting explanation and also a relevant topic on, on contemporary migration. And so um now we have time to questions uh, you all yes. make questions bring comments to to the debate um the questions uh, as professor Graham said uh, can also be made in portuguese so feel free to, to participate well I am the first. <laughs> well, Guilherme, uh, I thank you for uh, your consistent and pertinent presentation on, on this uh, issue about uh, the symmetry or asymmetry between mm -hmm. uh, left and uh, enter. But, uh, um, well, a, a topic very precious to me, you know. <laughs> well, I have a simple question, and is this. Uh, is it not a paradox that in this human rights regime, um, hmm? the, right, yeah. uh, the right to enter a state is actually a privilege given to us by states? Well, I put this uh, uh, this question because in the state of uh, in, uh, of these things, um, the interests of the states, uh, the the state's interests, uh, which does not always coincide with the interests of communities or uh, the interests of societies, is totally prevails over the interests of individuals. I think it's a problem. But for me, it's a problem <laughs> because I, I have. Uh, cosmopolitan approach about this issue. Uh, well, you think, what do you think about this? this uh, uh, it's a right uh, for uh, to live, but it's a privilege for you, you enter in this uh, world. Yes, uh, indeed. It's a privilege in actually in two senses of the word. <laughs> yes. Um, let me just uh, find the right, um, I mean, le le actually let me refer to uh, one of the uh, major theorists that you know so well. <laughs> Hello, <my hobby. laughs> yes, but yes, also, okay. <laughs> indeed, I, I would get to Sullivan Habib and eventually to Kant, of course, as okay. well. Yeah. But the one that I wanted to refer to is actually John Rawls, yes. <laughs> who in his uh, uh, Law of the Peoples claims mm -hmm. this. And let me show yeah. you. Now, this is actually a footnote, <laughs> which is very interesting because <laughs> it shows how sort of irrelevant it is from his, uh, from his uh, that for people who don't know, of course, the Law of the Peoples and uh, Marie yeah, Jean Rawls, this was an attempt to apply or actually mm -hmm. it was a reaction to his critics mm -hmm. that the theory justice uh, which as you know is his main theory 
uh, but was conceived in a sort of an, in, a, in a national uh, perspective. I mean, you can uh, argue with uh, you can argue with that, of course. But uh, the the point here is that with the law of the people sort of attempt, attempted to then respond to that to those arguments by mm -hmm. extending the fear of justice to the global level. Mm -hmm. And here's what he says about this. It's very yeah. very interesting. Okay, it may be objected. I'm quoting that the right of emigration lacks a point without the right to be accepted somewhere, somewhere else, of course, mm -hmm. as an immigrant. But many rights are without point in this sense. To give a few examples, the right to marry, mm -hmm. to invite people into one's own house, or even to make a promise. Mm -hmm. It takes two to make, a good, to make good of the, on these rights. Another complex question is how far the right to emigration should extend Okay, <laughs> whatever the answer is, certainly the right to emigration for religious minorities should not be merely formal mm -hmm. and that people should provide an assistance for immigrants when feasible. But the, I mean, you know, when he says this after, you know, this whatever the answer, this is a quibble which has to do with, with refugee rights. Okay, mm -hmm. so, you know, um, what he's saying is that, like Michael Walzer, by the way, mm -hmm. uh, 20 years before this, uh, is that actually, you know, for certain people, states should be obliged to uh, allow entry. But that's only for certain people, you know, mm -hmm. people that are um, oppressed religiously or politically mm -hmm. or whatever. Uh, and that's what the refugee, the refugee convention already uh, mm -hmm. covers, as I can show you here. Uh, and so this is already what it covers, right? Mm -hmm. it's, the, it's the, it's, this is already from uh, mm -hmm. 1951, even before actually, there was, a, even though it, it, it was enforceable and that's of course what upset many people like Hannah Arendt. Uh, but to answer directly to your, to your question, I, I can get to Hannah Arendt's uh, letter as well, the right to have rights and all that, but um, the point that I wanted to make in, in direct answer to your question is that um, it is a, a privilege. We do live in a world of states. Um, it is a privilege not only economically, because as you know, with the case of the gold visas in Portugal, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. didn't actually happen only in Portugal, for instance, Malta, was a, a very specific case where you could actually not only buy out your own residence rights, but also buy citizenship, which is a question that my own colleague in Uppsala, Elena Prats, is working mm -hmm. on. Um, uh, the right to buy citizenship, you know, that you can actually buy out yes. uh, a country's nationality because you have a lot of money and you want to be part of that community. Uh, especially for also financial reasons, mostly to do with investment, of course, and getting rich. <laughs> um, but um, uh, so that that is one way of of, uh, of entering a country, and that is a privilege in in the economic sense. But in, in broadly speaking, it is also a matter of privilege in the sense that states still own the world, uh, um, generally speaking, okay? Now, of course, states do not own their own territory or their own people in the same sense that, you know, I mean, I am a Portuguese citizen. I'm not property of a Portuguese state, of course not. But the point is that analogically, you can draw the connections, right? I mean, the point is that, um, states uh, determine who gets in uh, much more than they determine who gets to go out. And in that sense, it is a privilege, yes. We're talking about, when we talk about immigrants' rights, you know, a guy from, I don't know, from uh, Kenya or uh, Ethiopia, he will not have the same right in practice as an American a North American to get into Portugal. That's just how it works. And the international law 
reflects that. We need to understand that international law is a product of states' interests, mm -hmm. uh, their national interests. They, it's, it's, it's an output. Even the, even the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which of course we would all agree was a great achievement by many people, namely, mm -hmm. you know, um, uh, 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 Franklin Roosevelt's uh, wife, Eleanor Roosevelt. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, sure, I mean, and of course we can all agree that it, it is a great achievement. And not only at that time, but as, it, as time went by, it became actually binding at all states. We can say with a, with a fairly uh, st a great amount of certainty that the human rights regime has expanded, mm -hmm. that states are, uh, even if only formally, sort of accepting that as, you know, international norms that apply domestically as well. Um, but it, at the end, it is the case that that regime still privileges the interests of states over the interests of individuals. Mm -hmm. I, I want to qualify this by saying only one thing uh, more, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, and that is the following. Sorry, I'm just trying to look for uh, the right the right slide here i'm sorry but my point was this um, to answer to give a final answer to your to your question um, um, the um, Oh, exactly. It was about Ben Habib. Now I remember. Ben okay. Habib, yes. <laughs> yes. Um, so Ben Habib is right in the following way. That is, um, and also uh, uh, even Kant. I mean, Kant mm -hmm. was the first to find out a sort of third uh, line relationship that was going on in international relations. Mm -hmm. So basically, you know, since Westphalia, mm -hmm. uh, and even before that, of course, international relations were about relations between states, mm -hmm. okay? And of course, there was another very relevant relation uh, within um, politics, which was the relation between uh, political authority and its own subjects, mm -hmm. the subjects to that authority. To, right? who was to be subject to the authority of the state was actually mm -hmm. a revolutionary jump, uh, mm -hmm. a revolutionary leap that you know people like, well, the contractarian theorists mm -hmm. made, especially since Thomas Hobbes, but even before that, you can go all the way back to the Salamanca school, you know, mm -hmm. theories, early theories, even medieval theories of popular sovereignty, you know, that tell you that state authority is not to be obedient to a transcendental authority namely the church or god or whatever but um, what the state the political authority and that's machiavelli as well ought to do is to ensure the safety of the people right mm -hmm. uh, and you have then suarez and uh, uh, hobbes and locke and all the mm -hmm. but there's a third sort of uh, of liquid, the, the diagonal line of reasoning, mm -hmm. which is not about how states relate to the people that are actually in the territory or that are somehow under its jurisdiction. And it's not either about how states relate to other states, but it's about how states relate to, so, to foreigners, mm -hmm. right, to others. And that was a major concern of Immanuel Kant. I mean, Kant, and that's why he's so important for cosmopolitanism, yeah. no matter how limited his cosmopolitanism actually is, and it <laughs> is, because we know that it is for, for all sorts of reasons, and even his rights of immigration are also limited to basically a right of hospitality, <laughs> as we know, a right to visit. Yeah. Uh, so Kant does not allow 
foreigners to actually come in and stay uh, uh, as a matter of principle, right? Mm -hmm. What he does say is that, you know, foreigners, they can leave their countries and they can come and visit and then mm -hmm. we'll see whether or not they have an intention to harm us or whatever, right? And then, so it's a highly qualified rival. But the, uh, so it's it's actually the spirit of the contemporary human rights regime that is already being anticipated by Kant, which at the time is obviously in itself uh, a, um, a very important precedent. But the the point here that I wanted to return to Sayla Ben Havi and even of course Hannah Arendt, which inspired her, mm -hmm. is to say that. Um, you you are still far from having a right to have rights. Uh, to claim. Yes, a right to have rights. Mm -hmm. you, you don't have a right to have rights. I mean, yes. you have rights only to the extent that you are a citizen of a country. Yes. Only if you are under the jurisdiction of a country and you are a national to that country, will you have access to full enjoyment in practice of human rights. Yeah. Uh, if you are a foreigner living in another country, with the probable exception of the European Union, um, <coughs> in which I would even argue that probably, you know, as a Portuguese mm -hmm. uh, living in Sweden, I would have actually have more human rights than in Portugal. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that, uh, that's, a, that's a polemical claim. Yeah. It doesn't matter. But, you know, um, um, the, the point being that there's this third line of relationship, which is how are states to accommodate for the rights, mm -hmm. for the human rights of people that are not their own citizens, that are not mm -hmm. their own nationals. Yeah. So non-citizens' rights, um, and you know we've 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 made in Western Europe, of course, still very limited. We've made a few progresses with respect to, you know, letting refugees vote, for instance, um, or for instance, letting within the European Union, letting other European others, sorry, citizens from other EU countries vote in regional elections. So for instance, when I was living in Sweden, I voted for uh, municipal uh, elections and also European and even regional. So for the three, the only elections that I was not allowed to vote were uh, the national ones. So for the actual government, you know, the actual national parliament. Um, so, but, but, but then we're talking only about political rights, okay? Uh, um, so, but the point being that um, we're still very far from what I take to be the original dream of the drafters of the UN Human Rights Declaration back in the 40s. Uh, they started drafting it even before the war was ended. And then they came to a, an agreement through the negotiations by the several delegations of, of all the states involved of what the rights uh, enshrined in the declaration ought to be. And you, it's very interesting because you see a whole debate about, well, if you have a human right to leave, then why don't we have a human right to enter somewhere else? And, you know, and states are like, well, we, we don't want that. We just want people we want our own nationals to leave if they want to, because that's a matter of democratic self-determination. You know, it's a matter, like John Locke said, I have it here, actually. I can show it to you. Um, so you have, a, you have a, a natural right to leave, a natural right to leave, which is in, for many authors, a, Precedent to human rights is the, is the natural rights discourse, right? Uh, I can talk about that a, a bit if you want to. But the point is that, you know, if I am to be bounded by, author by the authority of a state democratically, then I should be willing, willingly, um, I, I should be part of that state voluntarily, 
right? Well, what happens if you're not voluntarily part of the state? Like, for instance, you don't want to pay taxes. Well, then you know, get out, just leave. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, actually, I have another paper where I argue this is a sort of uh, Foucauldian governmentality technique, you know, where you actually present the right to leave as freedom, but you're actually saying to people that, you know, if you don't, if you don't want to pay taxes, just get out of here. We don't want you here. Uh, it's a, it's okay. a freedom. It's, I mean, it's disguised as freedom, but it's mm -hmm. actually a technology. Uh, okay. power i have i have a paper on that as well okay where i go um into a philosophical direction that the analytical in philosophy tradition, <laughs> yes? yeah the the analytically philosophy tradition of my department okay. wouldn't, wouldn't want me to <laughs> okay. but in any sorry, case sorry i want to say something yeah yeah sure, sure. <laughs> yeah sorry i'm so i want to say something for you mm -hmm. uh very simple question uh, what is the, I'm trying to understand this meaning. Uh, uh, what is the meaning of RL and RE? And yes. what is the relationship between them? Sorry, of course, yes. So yeah. um, RL is right to leave and RE is right to enter. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry I didn't explain that. I should have mm -hmm. said that mm -hmm. previously. Um, of course, the reason why, and then in the thesis, I actually have LRL, which is legal right to leave, or MRL, which is moral right to leave, according to whether authors are talking about a moral claim to leave, that is the set of reasons that you have to present in order to being morally justified to exit a country, whether or not that country enshrines that legal right to leave in the law that right to leave in the law then it's another matter uh, but usually now all of the countries in the world would have that right in their own constitution or legal system um, and then you have right to enter okay and the right to enter um, is so far um, a moral right you don't have a universal right to enter in the sense of the personal scope of that right. Uh, and by that, I mean that, you know, you don't have, a, in principle, you don't have a right to enter every country in the world just as much you have a right to leave every country in the world. That doesn't mean that, you know, if you leave a country and you end up at the border of another country, it, it I mean, that country might accept you, of course. But it doesn't accept you on the grounds of international law. It's not, that country is not obliged to accept you. And of course, there are a lot of details here which are important. So for instance, most often when you board a plane, so let's say you have a right to leave, uh, I don't know, uh, Uzbekistan, right? If you board a plane, with a passport mm -hmm. to go to some country, usually the authorities will, will, will already have granted you a right to enter into that specific country you are going to. Otherwise, they wouldn't even let you board a plane. Okay, this is a very practical matter, but it's a very important one. But there are exceptions to this. So for instance, you have that case of Asan Kontar, the guy who ended up, you know, the movie Terminal, right? Mm -hmm. Well, that movie was actually based on a real case. That actually happened. I mean, it doesn't necessarily mean that it happened the way it is told in, in the movie <laughs> with Tom Hanks, you know. Yeah. But uh, there are cases of uh, what I call Flying Dutchman. Flying Dutchman was a ghost ship. You know, it was a ship that was allowed to leave Holland back in the uh, 16th century. And they told the captain ship, listen, you're allowed to leave, but I don't know where you're going to or whether or not you're going to be accepted, but you're not allowed to return. So, you know, we were just sent out. And it was a good, so that, that's why we call it the Flying Dutchman. 
uh, which is based, it's not my idea, it's based on Susan Doyle's uh, idea, uh, as it was in the slide. Uh, but uh, the point here is that, for instance, that case of Hassan Kontar, which is now, has now been accepted uh, as a refugee in Canada, was a case of a guy from the uh, Emirates that, sorry, he was a Syrian, actually. He left Syria. He worked in the Emirates for a while. And then he was allowed to leave to Malaysia because Malaysia was the only country accepting flights from the Emirates um, without checking the nationality of the passengers. And then when they realized he was a Syrian, they didn't allow him in. So he got stuck in the airport. He was not able to uh, return. Uh, he tried to, I think he flew once to Cambodia, but then mm. the situation was the same, so he got stuck. And the point is that, you know, you always get into these situations where, you know, people are allowed to leave, but then they can't enter somewhere else. Um, and this is obviously both a practical problem for those uh, people, but I mean, generally speaking, a lot of people would argue it's a, it's a huge problem with the international human rights regime, both legally and morally. Okay. So that's the end to my answer. <laughs> <laughs> Well, this is the case of okay, the, the refugees in Orbiter, no? Refugiados in Orbiter. Okay. Yes, it is. Okay. I mean, we we call them refugees. They're not actual refugees, of course, mm -hmm. in the sense that they don't have the legal status of refugees. They are what the UN calls. Um, I mean, I have I have the statistics here, but they are a bit old. Uh, and by the way, I have to say this is not part of my research. Okay, okay. it's just a matter of, it's just a yeah. matter of curiosity. And of yes, course, I, I I want to I want to be as close to what is actually going on in the world as, as possible as well, uh, because that's important. But let me just show you here uh, what I have. Um, uh, this is data that I took from, I'm sorry, it's not indicated here properly, but it's data from my, that I took from the UN, the United Nations. And as you can see here, mm -hmm. you have, this is 2016. So this mm -hmm. was uh, almost five years ago, actually. Yeah. Uh, or, or six years, or, sorry, four years ago. Oh, yeah. But, uh, you know, there are a lot of, um, I mean, there are, all, there are a lot of problems with migration mm -hmm. that we don't mm -hmm. really know about necessarily. So, for instance, when you look at this map, mm -hmm. you have, I mean, today it's above 70 million people mm -hmm. that are, that are uh, labeled by the UN as persons of concern, okay? Mm -hmm. Not all of these are actually migrants. Actually... And this was actually brought, this was actually brought Guterres to the position of okay. Secretary it, General. It, it, okay. uh, you know, uh, um, uh, was, was the fact that a lot of the migrants are not even actual migrants. They don't even get to travel beyond the border. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They just run away from their own village or whatever it is they're, mm -hmm. wherever it is they're living. And they 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 stay in the country, so they are the so-called internally uh -huh. displaced people, IDPs, reaching almost forty million people around the uh -huh. world. Okay, that's almost the population of Spain, mm, yes. <laughs> you know, or Argentina, or whatever. Um, and here, yeah, and in the the countries that are sort of uh, really uh, the most affected by this is mm -hmm. our, our uh, war torn countries. So Syria, Iraq, um, the Congo, uh, Central Republican uh, Africa, uh, um, Yemen, uh, and also Colombia due to the war with the FARC. Mm -hmm. 
actually Colombia is a very interesting case because they have almost 7 million people internally displaced, um, uh, which is, uh, uh, it's a catastrophe, actually, humanitarianly mm -hmm. speaking. But um, the, the refugees that you were talking about are um, uh, compounded by uh, these two, uh, sorry, let me just uh, show you here more detail. Again, this is uh, from a while ago. Um, it's people that are stateless, mm -hmm. reaching today almost uh, 4 million uh, people, which is a lot, and then asylum seekers and mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, refugees. But of course, then what you need to understand is that, so for instance, in this case, when you see, when you, when you have the label attached, mm -hmm. the label refugee, attached to the people coming in in boats and, you know, being rescued mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they appear on the TV on prime time. Um, um, we don't know what happens to them, actually, whether or not. I mean, they're, certainly they are rescued, but I don't know wh where they take them to. <laughs> so, you know, being rescued here, it's, um, uh, of course, I mean, I'm very part proud of the Portuguese Marine Corps and the, the, <laughs> but I mean what happens to those people we don't know we just we just watch them being rescued right that's one thing uh, so uh, and of course that's a good thing <laughs> we, you don't want them to stay in those boats but the, the, I don't know what happens to them after um, I mean I'm not raising any suspicion here but I would like to see actually see where those people then are delivered to i mean mm -hmm. and what conditions will they face once they are brought to the shore um, and uh, let alone the fact that that shore might be italy but it also might be libya <laughs> <laughs> so we, we, we don't know uh, but the, the point that i wanted to make here is that when you hear about refugees we're talking i mean journalistically speaking we're talking about informal refugees we're not talking about people that have actually received their legal mm -hmm. status of asylum mm -hmm. and that's very important mm -hmm. because uh, uh, you know in order to apply for asylum you need to get to the country mm -hmm. uh, in which you are then going to apply to asylum mm -hmm. and uh, so you need to leave I mean you know you're you know, you're you're a poor and hungry Ethiopian. Mm -hmm. You got to Libya, right? And now you want to get into a boat to get to Italy, and you only um, have a chance—a very minimal one—but you mm -hmm. only have a chance of applying to refugee status. Not only if you fill in those criteria that uh, we all we all know what they are. Uh, you know, being a victim of war or some sort of persecution or oppression at home or whatever. But you only get to apply to that status once you get to the territory um, uh, of that country or you get on board of the ship that is registered under the jurisdiction of that country, which is called flag sovereign, the flag sovereignty principle in international law. And so that's... Um, a very limiting aspect of, of all of this because it means that basically you need to take the risk to leave a country without knowing whether or not you're going to be accepted in the other even if mm -hmm. only for the sake of applying to refugee status. Mm. Eu posso fazer uma pergunta? Sim, sim. Eu... sim. É... Ora bem, eu, eu achei isso tudo muito interessante, mas uh, há uma questão, uh, tenho, tinha várias questões, mas vou pôr só uma. O, nas condições atuais que temos no, no mundo, uh, como é que seria uh, ter... Uh, 
essa simetria de direitos, ou seja, o direito de, 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 de entrar ser igual ao direito de sair. Uhum. O que é que aconteceria no mundo? Uhum. Tenho alguma pergunta. ideia? Tenho, tenho algumas <risos> ideias. Tenho algumas okay. ideias sobre isso. Muito bem, gostava de ouvir. Uh, então, se calhar vou responder em português, não é? Um, eu acho que, uh, quer dizer, se nós uh, encontrássemos de um dia, do, do dia para a noite, ou da noite para o dia, <risos> uma equivalência absoluta sem pensar exatamente, sem gerir os fluxos, seria um desastre, como é óbvio, não é? Nós não podemos ter, porque de repente chegavam milhões, não é? E, e toda a gente, se, se, quer dizer, se muita gente que está em desvantagem soubesse que tinha um direito de entrada noutro país, emigrava logo, não é? Portanto, eu sei que estou a ser muito, se calhar, para muitas pessoas isto seria um argumento cínico, mas, isto, mas é assim, portanto. Agora, nós, há várias formas de estar a voltar a este problema, quer dizer, eu acho que uh, o Dublin Agreement, que foi encontrado nos anos 90, foi péssimo na União Europeia, depois houve um segundo acordo de Dublin e, entretanto, já foi uh, substituído por outro tipo de acordos em que a ideia, que também resultou mal, aliás, mas já, que, já é um sinal de que se está a procurar gerir a situação no sentido de alocar a vários países um certo número de imigrantes. Não é? Neste caso, no caso da União Europeia, eram apenas refugiados, tinham que ter o estatuto, tinham que pedir o estatuto, aliás, isso foi isso que marcou o regime de Dublin, o regime aqui regional, no sentido de um conjunto de regras e normas que regulam... Uh, a migração só de refugiados, não é? Uh, e aqui, obviamente, isto tem muito a ver com o conflito na Síria, que foi um desastre do ponto de vista uh, migratório. Uh, porque, de facto, o que aconteceu na Síria foi, para além dos milhões de mortos, foram os milhões de pessoas que conseguiram uh, sair, ainda bem que conseguiram, não é? Uh, e, aliás, a maior parte deles, uh, uma, uma grande parte deles foi, foi para a Turquia, nem sequer foi para, para a Europa, mas uma boa parte também chegou à Europa e sobretudo à Grécia. E a ideia era que uh, era regular, era impedir, aliás, que esses migrantes pedissem estatuto de refugiado em vários países. Ou seja, imagino, chegavam à Grécia e pediam estatuto de refugiado, depois apanhavam outro barco e iam para a Itália e pediam estatuto de refugiado, e isso não podia ser, não. Podia ser, não é? E, portanto, o que eles fizeram é, bom, então, pedem refugiado ao primeiro país a que chegarem. Só que isso, obviamente, é, o, país, o, primeiro, a, a, o primeiro país a que chegam são os países mais próximos, não é? Foi um desastre. É, e, portanto, a Grécia foi, já tinha a crise económica que nós conhecemos, é, é, apanham com esta, com esta em cima, que é uma crise de refugiados, e obviamente toda a gente a pedir ao primeiro país da União Europeia, o primeiro no sentido daquele que está mais próximo dentro da União Europeia do conflito, é, é lá que vão parar todos, os, ou, ou muitos dos pedidos de asilo. E obviamente a Grécia, é, com a capacidade burocrática que nós conhecemos dos países do sul da Europa, não teve capacidade, e mesmo que tivesse outra, que tivesse a capacidade burocrática da Suécia ou do Reino, não interessa, ou da Alemanha, não teria capacidade, e portanto foi um desastre, não é? E eu continuo a achar que o desastre humanitário que nós vemos nos campos de refugiados de Moria e de Lerte são ainda uma consequência dessa incapacidade de gestão por parte dos Estados que não estavam à espera, obviamente, de receberem uma vaga tão grande logo a primeira vaga. Porque depois há casos muito complicados, não é? Crianças que, não, que vêm sem os pais, quem não se consegue atribuir uma nacionalidade, e portanto se não se, não se consegue atribuir uma nacionalidade nós não sabemos se foram sírias e portanto se foram vítimas de guerra, se podem ou não aceder ao estatuto de refugiado, se não podem aceder ao estatuto de refugiado é uma chatice, se podem aceder a outro tipo de refugiado, pode ser da pátria, que também já é um estatuto legal para isso, uma convenção que regula isso, mas é, são situações muito complicadas e depois na prática, por muito que hajam os estatutos e que existam essas uh, convenções, é muito difícil ir indivíduo a indivíduo ver quem é que corresponde a esse rótulo. Uh, agora, o que eu acho é que 
portanto, à partida, isso não poderia ser feito assim. O que eu acho é que, por exemplo, uh, uh, havendo boa vontade e havendo, obviamente, vontade política, vontade política, nomeadamente da parte das Nações Unidas, uh, as Nações Unidas fazem aquilo que os Estados que fazem parte das Nações Unidas querem que as Nações Unidas façam. Uhum. também eh, nós não podemos esperar milagres do António Guterres como também não podemos esperar do Ban Ki-moon ou do Kofi Annan, quer dizer, eles vão fazer aquilo que os Estados, e nomeadamente os Estados no Conselho de Segurança, os permanentes determinarem a Rússia, os Estados Unidos e a China sobretudo não é? e portanto, se estes três países disserem assim nós vamos durante um período de 10 anos estabelecer aqui uma lista de 10 países que estão dispostos a receber tantos imigrantes que, tendo já emigrado, né, podem vir para aqui e receberão um estatuto legal, pode não ser o de refugiado, que em alguns casos até é altamente privilegiado, porque, por exemplo, os miúdos têm acesso livre à educação, eles têm acesso a trabalho, à habitação, às vezes gratuito, ou com rendas muito baixas, etc. Uh, epá, isso conseguia-se fazer num regime de rotatividade, com tempo e pensado, e obviamente com o acordo dos respectivos Estados, isso conseguia-se fazer. Agora, não pode ser, é, uh, todos os, todos, quer dizer, podemos emigrar todos os Estados, agora podemos emigrar para todos, não é? Não, também não pode ser assim, não é? Mas eu acho que podíamos caminhar lentamente para... Para, uma, para, uma, para um mundo melhor, com reformas piecemeal, e que têm que ver sobretudo com a governança das migrações, ao nível da Organização Mundial das Migrações e de outras, de outras agências, as organizações, mesmo estas organizações, já disse isto, volto a dizer, dependendo da vontade dos Estados, não é? porque estas, as organizações são organizações de Estados, Uhum. Uh, isto é o que eu estou sempre a dizer aos meus alunos de organizações internacionais e de governança internacional e de relações internacionais em geral Quer dizer, porque eles dizem, então porquê é que a ONU não... Porque, uhum. porque, porque a ONU faz aquilo que os Estados e no Conselho de Segurança nós sabemos que se houver um veto acabou, a resolução fica por ali né? Uh, mas eu agora estou, quer dizer, estou a falar do Conselho de Segurança, uh, a questão migratória nem sequer é levada ao Conselho de Segurança, mas o que eu estou a dizer aqui é, é dar apenas um exemplo, quer dizer, por analogia, uh, desde que os Estados uh, aceitassem, eu acho que um, uh, um esquema de rotatividade pensado, que fosse estudado com base em estatística minimamente atualizada, uh, olhando para aquilo que são os fluxos migratórios, de onde é que vem a maioria das pessoas e para onde é que vão, seria possível encontrar soluções, pelo menos temporárias. Há outra coisa que eu queria dizer em relação a isto, muito rapidamente, que é, as migrações, sejam as migrações irregulares, sejam os migrantes regulares, portanto legais, uhum. como eu já fui e, portanto, e haverá muitos portugueses, não é? um, são um produto da igualdade económica entre países e da geopolítica. Se instalar uma guerra, no, sei lá, agora não quero estar a ser, se instalasse outra guerra no Médio Oriente, Uh, quer dizer, lá teriam os países do costume, o Líbano, uh, a Jordânia, a Turquia, de apanhar outra vez com vagas de milhões e milhões de imigrantes. E aí não há governança internacional que consiga regular isso. Não é? Portanto, as migrações são, são uma consequência da, da situação política, económica e humanitária dos países. Portanto, eu, não, eu não acho que os instrumentos jurídicos e os argumentos morais hum, estritamente sobre as migrações e o que é que são o direito de sair, isso deve corresponder ou não, eu não tenho a ilusão que isto vai resolver os problemas todos das migrações. O que vai resolver os problemas todos das, das migrações é de facto a capacidade dos Estados de terem 
situações políticas internas pacíficas e justas do ponto de vista económico e social. E terem também, obviamente, o módico de garantia de liberdades que, que a serem oprimidas ou reprimidas, obviamente as pessoas fogem. Portanto, é, é, é a minha resposta a essa pergunta. Não tenho, não tenho muitas ilusões desse, desse ponto de vista. Acho que há aspectos, aqui este aspecto de rotatividade pode ser melhorado, é uma proposta que tenho vindo a pensar, posso escrever, posso vir a escrever mais tarde sobre ela, a tese não fala nada sobre, não é problem solving, como se costuma dizer no anglicismo na academia anglo-americana, não procura ainda resolver nada, apenas procura mapear um debate que é jurídico em parte e, e ético na outra parte. Uh, mas mais tarde, e, e já há propostas dessas, já, já há autores, o Collier e o um, Ian Hathaway, o Gregor Noll e outros teóricos. O Gregor Noll, por exemplo, propôs que os pedidos de asilo pudessem ser feitos em embaixadas dos países, de acordo com uma certa ordem e com uma certa triagem muito criteriosa, como é óbvio. Uh, portanto, imaginem se um afegão pobre fosse vítima de uh, perseguição política, ele poderia deslocar-se à embaixada de, sei lá, à Espanha para pedir um asilo, em vez de ter que fazer a viagem toda até a Espanha. Para, né? Portanto, há certas soluções, mas são sempre soluções que dependem muito daquilo que são as condições de, de paz e de estabilidade no planeta. E depende das embaixadas, porque depois podem entrar na embaixada e não sair da embaixada. Pois. Não é? Só por, é ou não sair vivo da embaixada, que também acontece. Isso, isso também pode acontecer, sim. Também pode acontecer. Okay. Bem, eu não sei se uh, Michel tem alguma questão. Não. Olha, eu, eu na verdade tinha três questões. Mas... Ah, então, eu, ah, bem, é verdade. eu bem parecia que tinha, que tinha, que tinha. Mas, mas se calhar uh, não ponho os três, não é? Também a, a duração da sessão e, e o compromisso do, dos horários da, da, da sessão. Mas a, a Michelle e o Eduardo podem me enviar as questões, as outras que tinham por e-mail e eu terei todo o gosto em responder. Também. Ah, obrigada, professor. Sim. Mas a Michelle, mas tinha uma pergunta mesmo assim, diga. É, não, uma, uma, uma das, das perguntas que tinha, é, e, em parte também toca o que a professora Maria João perguntou na, na primeira intervenção, era um, se, se nós poderíamos dizer que, que este dilema de assimetria uh, entre os direitos uh, de, de sair e de entrar um, surgem ou pelo menos saltam aos olhos quando nós encaramos a migração forçada ou a migração, como estávamos aqui a falar, dos refugiados e das, das, dos perseguidos políticos ou vítimas de guerras eh, civis. Pelo menos isso do ponto de vista eh, legal. Uhum. Um, vamos ver... Na questão dos, dos refugiados e das migrações forçadas, nós temos uma série de desafios aqui pela frente que, que são muito, vão ser muito complicados de responder se não se proceder urgentemente a uma reforma do conceito de refugiado. Isso é uma sugestão teórica, académica, que já muitos teóricos avançaram, nomeadamente para incluir na definição de refugiado pessoas que estão uh, em crise humanitária profunda, comunidades que estão em crise humanitária profunda e, portanto, são confrontadas com situações ou de pobreza, uh, não é de pobreza, desculpe, é de, de situações de doença extrema, uh, fome ou uh, os chamados refugiados climáticos. Por exemplo, nós sabemos que eh, o Kiribati, que é um Estado, aliás um reino, é uma monarquia né? um, do Pacífico, vai desaparecer nos próximos 30 anos por causa do, de, do aumento da subida do nível do mar, de, que é uma consequência do gelo, um, 
e, e portanto o Kiribati, as ilhas do Kiribati, o arquipélago, vai desaparecer por completo. Ora bem, o que é que acontece? Aliás, eu orientei uma tese, co-orientei uma tese com a professora Liliana, aí na Universidade da Beira Interior, sobre isso, a tese da Mariana Varandas. E ela escreve, é uma tese interessante, por acaso, porque ela olha para os desafios legais, mas também políticos, genericamente, o que, é que é, o que é que vai ser feito a estas pessoas, não é? Que elas vão ser forçadas a sair, não é? Aliás, elas vão ser forçadas a sair de um estado ao qual não podem retornar. Portanto, como é que elas podem reclamar um direito humano de regresso se já não têm nenhum estado ao qual regressar, não é? <risos> Daqui a 30 anos ou 50, vá, para ser muito otimista, não podem, não é? E, portanto, têm que, têm que lhes ser garantido, obviamente, é a convenção de regulação do estatuto da pátria, que eu agora não me recordo da data, mas depois podem consultar isso, já regula precisamente também o estatuto para refugiados apátridas, está bem? Mas, portanto, e de qualquer forma, mas, mas quer dizer, o problema dos direitos humanos, eu falava há bocado sobre a Ana Arendt, depois não explorei isso, é que nós achamos sempre que o problema dos direitos humanos é um problema de enforcement pelo próprio Estado. Por exemplo, nós sabemos que há muitos cidadãos portugueses que não têm acesso a todos os direitos humanos, nomeadamente acesso à justiça. Não é? Ou sabemos, e depois podemos, podemos pensar em vários direitos que nós achamos importantes e que não estão na lista de direitos humanos, não é? Um, ou que não obedecem àquela hierarquia de direitos humanos que nós conhecemos, de primeira, segunda e terceira geração, etc, etc. Mas o grande problema dos direitos humanos é que o que define um direito é um dever correspondente. E nós sabemos que quando temos, do ponto de vista jurídico, estritamente agora, também se aplica à, à, à ética, mas que é a ideia de que se eu tenho um direito, alguém tem um dever de proteger esse direito. E o problema é que com os direitos humanos, nós temos muitos direitos que não sabemos exatamente a quem é que corresponde ou quem é que deve proteger esse direito. Não é? Portanto, eu, enquanto ser humano, tenho um direito à educação. Mas a Declaração e a Convenção dos Direitos Humanos não me diz que é o Estado português que tem o dever de me dar educação, não é? ou, de, ou de me dar saúde, ou de, ou de garantir que eu tenho as condições de acesso à saúde. De uma forma mais simplificada. Ou a habitação. Ou a habitação, exatamente. É uma série de... de e depois mesmo que... Quer dizer, eu, ou melhor, claro que em Portugal eu tenho esse direito porque a Constituição portuguesa me diz isso, ou os códigos, ou, ou o sistema jurídico, mas... A questão é que nem todos os sistemas jurídicos garantem essa absorção de direitos humanos que, que a Convenção determina. E, portanto, é muito difícil identificar um, 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 duty, bearer para, um duty bearer para o right holder uh, correspondente. Obviamente que em Estados Ocidentais ricos, Estados sociais relativamente apetrechados, um, isso é mais, é mais possível fazer, até porque também tem sistemas jurídicos que já absorveram essa, essa e vimos há bocado, aliás, como a Constituição uhum. Portuguesa plasma quase literalmente a formulação do direito de emigrar só e que... Não só portuguesa, não só portuguesa. E claro, não, <risos> exatamente, exatamente. Uh, uh, só que é assim também depende do tipo de direito que nós estamos a falar, quer uhum. dizer, o, o, eu depois também falo um bocado sobre isso na dissertação esta parte é um bocadinho técnica e teórica, se calhar não é tão relevante para a, para a filosofia, é relevante, eu tenho sempre filosofia, que é o seguinte, o, o direito de emigrar é, é um liberty right, o que é que isto uhum. quer dizer? Na, na velha taxonomia ou tipologia ofeldiana, que era um autor uhum. americano, Uh, cuja tipologia, aliás, está quase a fazer, 20, está quase a fazer 100 anos, porque ele foi publicado em 1921, o que ele diz é que um liberty right é um direito de liberdade, ou seja, é um direito, é a lei a, a proteger juridicamente uma liberdade. Não é? uhum. E eu tenho uma liberdade uh, para fazer, para, para, 
né, por seguir um certo curso de ação ou não. Né? E, portanto, se eu quiser sair do país, o Estado tem que me deixar sair. Se eu, também, se eu não quiser sair, o Estado também tem que me proteger a liberdade de não querer sair. Por exemplo, no Brasil, já agora que estou a falar com o Michel, eh, o direito de voto não é um direito de liberdade, como nos outros casos. Né? Porquê? Porque eu tenho o dever de votar, não é apenas um direito. Não é? Portanto, a Constituição não protege... Hum, não sei se me deixaram de ouvir. Estamos a ouvir, estamos a ouvir. Ah, estão a ouvir? A Michelle é que ficou ali. Ah, pois a Michelle ficou, ficou... ali imobilizada. A Michelle está imobilizada. É. Mas uh, eu não sei se uh, eu não sei se tem mais alguma pergunta, porque nós devemos estar, mas... nós devemos estar quase mesmo a acabar, porque eu, eu tenho a impressão que coloquei duas horas, duas horas e pouco, portanto isto. É isso, é isso. A, 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 a sala Zoom está a acabar. Eu, 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 só, eu posso só fazer um comentário? Sim, 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 sim pode, sim. pode ir. Pô. Nem era para fazer. Eu estava a fazer aqui um bocadinho o papel da advogada do diabo, porque eu hoje dei comigo mesmo de manhã, nem, nem, tinha relacionado, nem estava relacionado com o um seminário, a pensar sobre isto. Talvez por causa dos debates presidenciais, não sei. Uhum. O professor falou sobre isso há minutos, sobre a questão de, de, de que as migrações estão sempre associadas à, à questão dos da condição socioeconómica dos países e, eventualmente, do nível de vida dos países, ou muitas vezes está ligado a isso, nomeadamente quando falamos de refugiados, mas não só. É curioso que, por exemplo, os países nórdicos chamam os imigrantes expats, não é? expatriados, uhum. e não propriamente a ideia do imigrante, um, e, e é, é um termo curioso. Não, a minha questão estava mais relacionada com a questão da democracia e da democratização face aos direitos. Portanto, nós estamos aqui numa discussão até um pouco filosófica, muito interessante, porque de certa forma ajuda muito a sedimentar um conjunto de valores que são fundamentais, e esses valores que depois, tanto da filosofia do político como da, como da filosofia do, do direito, que depois justificam a, a criação de quadros legais e, e, e de uhum. modelos societais, ao fim e ao cabo, mas que depois muitas vezes chocam com a realidade local de, de, de muitas, de muitas populações, muitas vezes que não são instruídas e que essas sim vivem confrontadas com o resultado, nem sempre positivo, das migrações. Exatamente. Também e depois, é da, origem, da origem, muitas vezes, aos populismos, como nós ouvíamos, eram uma das justificações que o professor, não me recordo agora do, do, do anterior seminário, justificava. Quer dizer, eu também gosto muito de falar do direito, de, 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 do direito das pessoas de imigrarem, até porque também tenho uma família de imigrantes, etc., mas, mas eu não vivo, ou melhor, já vivi, por acaso até já vivi, vivi quase três anos no Seixal, no Fulteiro, e, e, e portanto sei que muitas vezes as populações migrantes, ou que são de segunda e terceira geração, estão também associadas, infelizmente, a casos de maior fragilidade social, maior exposição uhum. ao desemprego, e que isso depois também resulta maior crime, maior, maior confrontos sociais, e que naturalmente, quando as, as pessoas, as populações, democraticamente não reconhecem ou, não, ou, ou sentem que a decisão que é tida pelas esferas de elite ou das cúpulas não acompanham a sua realidade diária e a sua dificuldade na realidade diária, isso leva a que não seja fácil aceitar o direito de receber as pessoas nos mesmos termos do direito de as pessoas poderem sair do seu país e que, portanto, dificilmente se contrariará esta ideia de assimetria o professor explicou muito bem, se essa ideia da simetria for sustentada por uma, por uma agenda que se pretende que seja o mais democrática possível. Ou seja, uhum. há aqui também uma assimetria que eu colocaria, que é uma assimetria entre a, 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 a maioria, e depois entramos, podemos entrar aqui no debate sobre o que é que é democracia liberal ou não, não é? mas pelo menos a, maior, a, maior, a, a, a vontade de uma maioria que se confronta diariamente com a nossa realidade, e que não tem se calhar um conjunto de padrão de valores que lhe permita aceitar uh, uh, essa, esse social clash uh, e esse clash etnográfico que acontece, uh, face a, a estes direitos que nós aqui discutimos e que são super interessantes e, e, e muito ricos, certamente, uhum. mas depois confrontam-se com a realidade do dia a dia. Pois, eu acho que uh, é, é, de facto é preciso ter muito cuidado até que ponto é, é que onde, onde é que levamos esta agenda de simetrização, se podemos chamar assim, uhum. 
nós sabemos que, por exemplo, uma das razões que teve por trás do, do Brexit era o facto de muitos trabalhadores imigrantes no Reino Unido estarem, de facto, a deflacionar os ordenados e os, uh, uh, os ordenados e o dinheiro que recebiam os trabalhadores britânicos, uh, se isso foi em si um exercício de populismo ou não, eu penso que a estatística, por acaso, prova, prova o contrário. Portanto, de uhum. facto, uh, nós sabemos que numa parte significativa de certos setores industriais e agrícolas, os trabalhadores britânicos começaram a ganhar menos a partir do momento em que muitos imigrantes, eh, vindos sobretudo do leste da Europa, começaram a reclamar ordenados mais baixos e, portanto, isso levou a uma deflação do rendimento eh, desses nacionais. Isto não é populismo, isto não faz. Eh, e aí nós temos que perceber muito bem. Agora, o que eu também acho é que, vamos lá ver, nós já estamos numa era de conhecimento estatístico e de capacidade tecnológica e até digital e de comunicações epá, consegue perfeitamente gerar estatísticas minimamente fiáveis sobre o impacto económico da imigração o impacto económico da não imigração o impacto económico da imigração para certas regiões uh, o que é que certas populações com certas características podem fazer no Alentejo e que não podem fazer em Lisboa. Uh, quer dizer, nós conseguíamos fazer isso. O que preciso era ter, obviamente, políticas devidamente baseadas em estudos e em, em ciência, por muito precária e errónea que fosse, mas que eu acho que uh, esse repto é importante, que é não deixar que uma crescente simetria entre saída e a entrada, depois conduza a assimetrias ainda maiores nos países de entrada, mas já agora também nos países de saída, não é? Apesar de tudo, nós sabemos que as limitações, por muito aleatórias e arbitrárias que sejam nos países de entrada, nos países ricos, digamos assim, desenvolvidos, apesar de tudo, limitam muito a imigração e em último a imigração de muita gente de países que já estão pobres e que já estão com carências importantes do ponto de vista económico e até demográfico não é? e portanto desse ponto de vista volto a dizer acho que é importante que apesar desta agenda que me parece cada vez mais crescente, eu não estou a tomar lados aqui, não é? Uh, para uh, 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 de facto fazer corresponder um direito um direito humano de saída um direito humano de entrada universalmente eu acho que apesar de tudo tem que haver depois uma gestão dessa uhum. simetria crescente uhum. é um projeto normativo não é? uhum. uh, no sentido de fazer com que Uh, quer dizer, porque, porque senão qualquer dia estão, 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 estão um bilhão de pessoas a viver na Suécia em vez dos 10 milhões que lá estão, <risos> apesar do frio. Não é? Portanto, eu agora estou a, ser, estou, a ser, estou a dar um exemplo, estou a ridicularizar, estou a caricaturar um, um Estado, que obviamente que nós queremos todos viver em países que pagam bons ordenados, com um Estado social forte e com uma economia muito produtiva e muito pujante. Uh, e portanto, não pode ser assim. Agora, que, que de facto há aqui uma questão de igualdade e que as grandes questões de desigualdade a nível global se continuam a aprender com questões uh, internacionais, essa desigualdade é essencialmente uma desigualdade entre regiões do mundo, apesar das assimetrias que eu compreendo internas a cada país, e Portugal é obviamente um caso também muito importante de uma grande assimetria entre o interior e o litoral e entre o mundo rural e as cidades, Uh, Espanha aqui ao lado se calhar ainda mais uh, o que é facto é que as grandes desigualdades hoje em dia são de facto desigualdades uh, por um lado entre países uh, desenvolvidos e subdesenvolvidos e por outro lado entre populações que têm a sua cidadania assegurada com todos os direitos e deveres que lhes estão alocados mesmo que depois o Estado não seja capaz com certeza 
de garantir todos esses direitos na prática uh, e populações que ficam no limbo uhum. que saíram e que não conseguiram entrar em lado nenhum uh, e esses são os casos ou, ou, ou que saíram não necessariamente do país saíram das suas aldeias e cidades como os casos dos IDPs como vimos ali é uma população enormíssima, já ultrapassa os 20 milhões a nível mundial Uh, aliás, os IDPs são mais do que todos os outros casos de refugiados uhum. problemáticos todos juntos uhum. uh, e foi, foi aliás a grande causa do, do secretário-geral das, do secretário das Nações Unidas quando era alto comissário um, para os refugiados uh, há 10 anos atrás e portanto, uh, pronto uh, essa é uma questão que eu acho que, é, que importa atacar importa estudar mas claro, como o Ivo diz, sempre com uma atenção, ou como o Ivo diz, ou pelo menos como a pergunta dele me fez uh, responder desta forma, com atenção, a, a, obviamente, a questões de geopolítica, de geoeconomia, de equilíbrio uh, financeiro e social e políticas sociais, também de acolhimento, também de integração. E aqui, de integração, é mesmo, eu, eu oriento muitas teses sobre organizações humanitárias e sobre políticas estatais para acolhimento de imigrantes, não apenas para a assistência humanitária num primeiro momento, não é? mas depois para a integração desses imigrantes. Mas já há, de facto, um esforço, até por parte de muitas ONGs, portanto, entidades privadas, não sequer mais ou, ou menos uh, uh, bem-sucedidas, mas uh, no sentido de, uh, de facto, preparar muitos destes refugiados para, para o mercado de trabalho, portanto, uhum com a formação de certos skills, certas competências, e é esse trabalho, esse caminho para a cidadania social, neste sentido, para a plena integração, que, que, ainda, falta, que ainda falta fazer, sem descurar, obviamente, a assistência humanitária e médica e alimentar e sanitária, que também é importante, sobretudo agora em período de, de, de pandemia, não é? Bem, eu acho que vamos ter que dar a sessão por encerrada, porque ele deve estar mesmo a terminar o tempo do Zoom. Uh, agradeço imenso, Guilherme Marques Pedro, do fundo do meu coração. Eu é que agradeço. agradeço. Eu agradeço à Michel. E foi uma honra estar pela primeira vez aqui. Ah, ótimo, ótimo. Ótimo. E depois falamos sobre isso. Sim. Agradeço a todos a vossa presença uh, e pronto, e até à próxima, a próxima será, uh, eu acho que a próxima é só no princípio de março, porque agora veio as férias do semestre e portanto vamos ter duas em março, duas sessões em março. Portanto, preparem-se, porque vêm aí belos temas, cheios de <risos> problemáticas. Uh, e portanto agradeço-vos a todos, desejo-vos um bom ano, dado que ainda não tinha estado convosco. E até à próxima. Deus! Boa, boa Obrigada, professora. Muito obrigado. Muito obrigado. Muito obrigado.